Um, now, one of the things I really do enjoy about my job is, A, meeting our guest speakers and also um, finding out a little bit more about them. Um, as some of you know here, uh, my name is Nick Byrne. I'm acting as chair tonight, and I'm the UK director of the Confucius Institute for Business London. I'm also the director of the Language Centre here at LSE and also the chair of LSE Arts. So there's some nice sort of hats to put on at various times. And one of the nice things is that we've got a combination here of um, the creative industries. And also what we'll have tonight is somebody who's really going to nail some really important issues that I think are very, very important about the role of the creative industries the importance of the creative industries, but also <coughs> the potential there is in collaboration, continuation, promoting separate creative fields, but also bringing creative fields together. And I think it's something that I'm really looking forward to hearing. Now, uh, Lord Clement Jones, um, managing partner, DLL Piper, um, uh, chairman of its China Middle East desks, um, a whole background in the legal industries, um, very, very impressive role in terms of voluntary work, and I'm really, really quite stunned by what you've actually been involved in in terms of <coughs> autism, cancer research, um, governing bodies, you can imagine, highest of high levels, advisory board, College of Medicine, trustee of Barbican Centre Trust, council member of Heart of the City, and ambassador of Bart's Charity. Um, as a, God, I have to say it, I am a member of the Liberal Democrats. So it is a personal welcome. Well, I've not paid my £25, so I don't know if technically I am, but um, uh, also we have, um, for me, great pleasure to have somebody who is in the House of Lords and also um, representing the Lib Dems all party uh, parliamentary group on China. Um, we also actually work very much with Baroness Cousins in um, all party group on languages. Um, in fact, in the last few years, I've seen the out inside of the House of Lords more than I ever would have thought possible in various debates and, and talks. And I do actually have to say, there are a lot of people in the House of Lords that work incredibly hard about getting key messages across. So I'm a bit of a late convert, I have to say. Um, I'm going to really sort of leave it to you, Lord Jones, to, to start things off. And I say that I think it's a really, really key topic, and I'm very, very pleased that hopefully this year we'll have at least two talks about the creative industries, possibly three, because it's something that has such potential that can make such a big connection between people, between industries, and it's something where the language of the creative industries really does bring people together. At this point, I'd like you to put your hands together for um, a warm welcome to us. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Nick, thank you very much. I think I'd better quit uh, uh, after that introduction. I'll quit while I'm ahead, you know. Um, but uh, thank you very much. And uh, you've got some very good qualifications there, I must say, for your introduction. Uh, regular visitor to the House of Lords, Liberal Democrat, uh, uh, etc. So thank you very much uh, indeed um, for that. Um, now, really, uh, uh, tonight's lecture does uh, bring together, and this is why I'm a complete pushover when people give me the right kind of invitation, uh, uh, two great interests of mine, uh, China and our creative industries. And uh, by that, I mean the whole range of cultural activity, including the creative, visual, and performing arts and the content industries. And it's uh, rather good, actually, to see a number of very familiar faces associated associated not only with China but also with the creative industries. Um, so I think I'm in uh, extremely good company uh, tonight. And I want to talk about the relationship between China and the UK in the creative industries and demonstrate that we now have a great opportunity for a strong creative and cultural partnership between China and the UK if we seize the moment. Now the UK has the largest creative sector in Europe and this includes film, TV, video games and publishing, architecture, art, design, fashion, film, video games, music and software. Now our creative industries are worth something like £71 uh, uh, billion pounds per year to the UK economy 
and they represent 5% at least of the UK GDP, and some people believe that's a bit of an underestimate. And the sector as a whole is growing at twice the rate of the rest of the economy, and it accounts for about 2 million jobs currently. But also, um, uh, 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 exports are worth £16 billion annually, or 4% of all UK goods and services exports. So again, not only big for the GDP, but big for exports. And a crucial factor in recent growth has been the tax treatment of film production, and this was followed by high-end television and animation, and later the video games relief. And now we've got this new theatre production tax relief and patent box, which will also have a major impact too. So what has been very interesting is that some of our financial policies, our tax policies, have been looking very carefully at the contribution that the creative industries uh, can make to our economy. And that's all part of what we might describe as the coalition's rebalancing agenda. And uh, the tax uh, treatment of film production has supported more than £5 billion of investment into British films and contributed to a 70% increase in the film production workforce since its introduction. And uh, uh, I expect that is going to be the same, uh, have the same impact on television, uh, animation and video games uh, in due course. In London, where we are, uh, creative industries represent 16% of the local economy. As Innovate UK, and they used to have a far more user-friendly uh, uh, description, called, they would call themselves the Technology Strategy Board, which really tells us much more about what they actually do. They said in their Creative Industries Strategy document last year, the UK has a share of around 5% of the global export market for creative goods. It is a broad and diverse sector which ranges from advertising and crafts to performing arts and video games. As well as their direct economic value, these industries play an important role in catalyzing innovation across the wider economy through the products and services they provide, but also as a means of originating and spreading new ideas, knowledge and ways of working. So the significance of the sector uh, is enormous. And as uh, they say, major trends of digitization and convergence have all contributed to the emergence of a digital landscape of increasing complexity. And it's that digital landscape which is one of the, the great opportunities. And the strength and depth of the UK's creative industries is a huge advantage for us. In the UK, we've got great expertise, not just in those creative industries, but in delivering creative clusters media hubs, film studios and the like. And increasingly, our creative sector is a vital aspect of our international trade and investment, especially our films and TV content. Britain has a global position of strength in the visual effect industry, as was seen in the movie Gravity with Sandra Bullock and George Clooney. And this was built on the success of the Harry Potter franchise, War Horse and Dark Knight. 70% of international advertising agencies have their European headquarters in the UK. The UK's advertising system does set the standard in successful self-regulation, being governed by codes of practice that are designed to protect consumers by ensuring that advertising in the great phrase is legal, decent and truthful. UK fashion designers export 66% of the clothing they produce and the fashion industry contributes over £37 billion annually to the British economy and employs over a million people. Famous and creative brands such as Burberry, Jaguar, Bentley, Aston Martin, Land Rover, not to mention <coughs> Chivas Regal and Johnny Walker, are highly sought after by Chinese consumers. The UK is home to over 40% of Europe's electronic design industry, Samsung's European Design Centre is located in London, for example. Huawei has invested in a design centre here, too. There are now more than 1,500 companies in Tech City in London. 70,000 people are now employed there, and there were 15,600 start-ups there in each of the past two years. And the UK is also the highest net exporter of computer games and information services in the G7. UK-made computer games account for 12% of the world games market. The UK boasts 26 of the world's most profitable game studios. 
and all major international studios have UK-based developers, including Microsoft, Sony, Disney, and Nintendo. And our architects generate in excess of £700 million in revenue each year. And the UK is the global leader in TV formats, accounting for 53% of all exported format hours in the worldwide market, compared to 14% for the USA. TV exports have also flourished. The value of UK TV exports increased by 127% between 2006 and 2009, putting us only second to the US in terms of international sales. British program makers are already making inroads as Chinese viewers increasingly stream UK content through local platforms. Chinese viewers all seem to be watching Sherlock and Downton Abbey. The BBC's third series of Sherlock received almost 70 million viewers on the digital platform Yoku, and the Chinese viewing figures of 160 million per episode, in particular for Downton Abbey, are quite extraordinary. Of course, Everybody thinks that we now in the House of Lords live like that. <laughs> I've even seen adverts in China for courses in British etiquette. The UK Creative Industries Council has now launched Creative UK, which is the creative industry's industrial strategy, which sets out ambitious plans to increase the number of UK creative companies that export around the world. But something very important for creative industry is also happening in China. In the last two years, I've visited a wide variety of cities, including Beijing, Shanghai, Hangzhou, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Chengdu, Qingdao, Jiamen, Suzhou, Taiyuan, and Nanjing. That's quite a list. And in all of them, whether in discussion with business people, national, provincial, or municipal officials, or students and academics, I've seen total agreement about the new importance to China of creativity and the creative industries. The sector has been growing at more than 20% a year since 2004. There are more than 50,000 cultural and creative enterprises in China, of which 8,000 are state-owned. The most profitable sectors have been advertising, IT services, tourism, indoor entertainment, cable TV services, and publishing. In business, the emphasis is now on creativity, and this is very much reflected in the 12th five-year plan, which takes up, us up to next year, and it marked, when it was launched, an important new approach where creative and artistic skills are being highly valued. As the former chairman of CBBC, the China-Britain Business Council, Sir David Brewer, said in uh, UKTI's publication, Creative Industries in China, Opportunities for Business, which was published a few years ago, uh, in the year the plan was adopted, having largely relied on imports of foreign design and technology for many decades, China has woken up to the need to develop its own creative abilities. China's move from made in China to designed in China is creating many and diverse opportunities for British companies. Whether designing mobile phones or iconic new buildings, producing television documentaries or mobile applications, China's creative sector is a field where British companies, both small and large, can really do well. So the phrase moving from made in China towards created in China indicates a desire to move from the hardware-driven approach of manufacturing and assembling to others' design towards a higher value-added economy of conceiving the concept and design elements as well, a move towards encouraging creativity and innovation. And all this is very well documented in Sean Ryan's book, The End of Copycat China. Last year, China overtook Japan to become the second largest film market worldwide far bigger than Britain or India, and is set to overtake the US by 2020. 3D is especially popular in China. Just look at the recent success of Transformers Age of Extinction. I wonder how many people in this room have actually seen Transformers Age of Extinction. Any hands raised? Oh, well, that's, not, that's, that's a decent proportion. Thank you. Um, so you know what I mean. Every day in China, 10 new cinema screens are added to the country's huge collection of 13,000. Uh, that can't be right. It must be, must be much more than that. China is home to the largest film studios in the world, at near, uh, 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 and its film industry grew 36% over the past year and is now 
billion pounds annually. Digital media, animation and the games industry have all grown very fast in China. In 2011, the Chinese animation industry uh, 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 reached one billion in value. And then, of course, there is a massive Chinese publishing industry seeking opportunities outside China. In 2012, we had a very successful London book fair with China's publishing industry as the key focus. Now, I would argue strongly that the time is ripe for Creative Britain to partner with China to promote creativity and growth, both inbound and outbound in a variety of ways. And I've seen real enthusiasm in China for partnership with British creative industries and creators. This enthusiasm for co-production, partnership and investment in the tech and creative industries is now particularly alive amongst younger business people in China. The UK in particular is in a great position to promote itself as the best possible creative partner for China. UK creativity is highly marketable, award-winning and sought after by global business. In 2010, the UK pavilion at the Shanghai Export Expo made a huge impact. The Chinese took genuine pleasure in the success of the British Pavilion and took to heart what we call the Seed Cathedral and they called the Dandelion. The Thomas Heatherwick designed UK Pavilion not only won the top prize, it cost a fraction of the other nation's pavilions and was named one of the best 50 inventions of 2010 by Time magazine. In 2011, Beijing Design Week chose London to be its first honoured guest city and the UK was represented at the event by some of our finest designers. And the London Olympics were a huge boost to the perceptions of British creativity and creative heritage when we took over the Olympic torch from Beijing. The London Olympics were followed by the Great Campaign. On his visit to China in October last year, the Chancellor, George Osborne, hosted a Creativity is Great reception to showcase British innovation, tech and creative industries and encourage Chinese creatives to experience what Britain has to offer. And to cap it all, guests were greeted by the waxworks of royal couple William and Kate to, march the launch, to mark the launch of Madame Two Swords in Beijing. Now that's salesmanship for you. Since the PM visited China last year, Buckinghamshire-based Pinewood Studios has signed an agreement with Wanda to advise on the design and construction of a new film and television studio complex in Qingdao. Once completed, it will be one of China's largest film and TV studio facilities. London-based Silvergate Media has signed a deal with CCTV to broadcast its children's TV programs, Octonauts and Peter Rabbit in China. And if our creative businesses can get the basics right, there is no reason why they should be deterred or frightened by emerging markets such as China. But we really need to understand how the Chinese market works. A report published in 2012 by Nesta, formerly the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts, crossing the river by feeling for stones, a new approach to exporting creative content to China, mentions that a particular stumbling block in China for UK creatives is the uncertainty around local demand for their products. They highlight the danger that the UK is not investing in building the relationships with Chinese consumers uh, now that could pay handsomely in the future, if and when the business models have been worked out. Nesta point out that success depends on a delicate balancing act between the global and the local, and describe the runaway success of the Kung Fu Panda films in China that were produced by US studio DreamWorks Animation and featured Western actors, but mixed reference to martial arts films with classic legends to offer an imaginative and spirited take on Chinese culture. Now, Harvard Business Review, and it'd be very interesting to see whether you agree with this, summarizes the key characteristics of the Chinese consumer as First of all, price sensitive but brand conscious. Secondly, lacking trust, and that's why Taobao's business model is very successful versus uh, Western brands. Thirdly, the product of the one child policy, which means children related goods and services play a central role. 
and fourth, increasingly informed, sophisticated and active. And many uh, Chinese, of course, travel overseas to buy genuine branded products. The biggest phenomenon in China at this time is the internet. And China remains a controlled society with regard to conventional mass media. But by contrast, information circulates very rapidly on the internet because practically and logistically there is only so much that any government can control. The internet also carries significant credibility and people more readily believe in information found on the internet than in television adverts. It is clear that the UK tech creative digital sector will be unable to exploit its strengths unless it becomes more familiar with the way that Chinese consumers access online content. E-commerce continues to grow at an outstanding rate in China and has now reached $1.4 trillion. In fact, Alibaba, through its uh, Tmall and Taobao brands, has become the world's largest online retailer, selling more than $170 billion in goods in 2012, more than eBay and Amazon combined. Any marketer in China should be developing a strong e-commerce strategy as brands' future market share will be inevitably linked to its online sales given current trends. How many Europeans here uh, present, for instance, know that Tuesday the 11th of November was Singles Day in China, a day that e-commerce companies have turned into the world's biggest for online shopping? Clearly, I can see that many of you have already been online on the 11th of November, but it is a very, very significant day for uh, e-commerce. Uh, Weibo is China's version of Twitter, Alibaba, it's eBay, and Baidu, a search engine offering a similar service to Google, not to mention WeChat, which is now being adopted by Western teenagers. And they are now gatekeepers to the Chinese online economy. So who needs Facebook, Google, Twitter, eBay, and Tumblr? There are many different impacts depending on different generations. For an important generation, the one-child policy plays the most critical role in shaping consumer and psychological behavior. As the first one-child generation, this generation faced unexpected opportunities as well as stress and challenge. The only child is the pivotal focus of the family, and they are afforded the best of everything. I don't know if you agree in the audience who may, may be uh, the beneficiaries of that. Uh, because of this, the impact of Western culture, brands and globalization has been stronger and has resulted in a global view amongst this generation. Now, I've been very impressed in recent visits to China by the new emphasis being placed by organizations such as UKTI, CBBC, the British Council, the FCO, and London and Partners on the creative industries. And they are seeking openings for British creative industry to partner in China. The Nesta report on creative exporting mentioned earlier shows the opportunities but also highlights that there are many regulatory hoops that you need to jump through when working in China. Just take the film industry for example. China's ticket sales are too big for major Western studios to ignore as films distributed in China can potentially make more than Hollywood productions released internationally. But breaking into China's box office isn't as simple as dubbing Western productions or adding subtitles. SAFT, the film regulatory body, has strict control over the content to be broadcast. <coughs> Chinese authorities view all films before release and have a significant effect on content. For example, Django Unchained was released in China as a foreign film, but pulled from cinemas minutes into its screening, reportedly because of background images of nudity. China still has an annual film quota for the number of revenue-sharing foreign films accepted for full distribution rights. Although that rose from 20 to 34 last year, the extra spots are reserved for 3D, IMAX or animations and competition is fierce. There have been, however, a number of very important recent developments bringing us closer together. The Film Cooperation Treaty, negotiated by the BFI and signed earlier this year, will give Chinese-led productions access to UK film tax relief and the BFI Film Fund, 
eligible co-productions will not be subject to China's quota on foreign films. And this will lead to real partnership between UK and Chinese filmmakers. So far, just two projects have been approved by SAFT under the treaty, with BBC Worldwide being one of the early producers involved. Under the new agreement, filmmakers will also be granted a larger share of box office relief at receipts. The new agreement also promises to strengthen transparency. In particular, rights owners will enjoy access to censorship decisions, ensuring that license deals cannot be terminated willy-nilly or renegotiated by the back door without rights owners having an opportunity to discuss problem areas with censors or inserting alternative films into previously signed import agreements. And this is a considerable advance on what are called assisted co-production uh, co-productions, essentially pure location services agreements. The new type of co-production will develop the material for local as well as international markets. There will need to be content relevant to the Chinese way of life and culture and a strong Chinese percentage of the cast under the terms of the treaty to qualify. Then there is the MOU, signed around the same time, between CCTV and our independent producers organization, PACT, exploring potential areas of collaboration with UK independent producers, which is very promising. In June, I took part in the third Technology Innovators Forum in Qingdao. TIFFIN is a major event uh, promising, uh, promoting our UK creative industries. At TIFFIN, Vince Cable, our business secretary, launched the Global Digital Media and Entertainment Alliance with China which will promote long-term relationships in the digital media and entertainment sectors. The intention is that this will encourage collaboration on delivering the next generation of products in music, film, digital and video games and deliver a massive boost to UK creative exports and position the UK as the favoured location for inward investment, creating more sustainable jobs and building a stronger economy. And it will greatly benefit the UK's creative industries. And already, Qingdao's West Coast New District has signed an MOU with UKTI in London to cooperate in building an international digital entertainment port. TIFFIN itself encouraged collaboration on delivering the next generation of all these products and brought together the most exciting Chinese and British creative technology companies with high-profile political, financial and entertainment leaders. Adopting a strategy that Chinese businesses in other sectors have pursued so successfully to develop their technological and managerial capabilities, 37 Chinese film companies are also being encouraged to agree joint ventures with leading foreign companies where Chinese companies have a majority stake. Pinewood Shepperton, home of James Bond, for instance, announced a joint venture with Chinese media group Seven Stars in April. The chief executive of the British Film Institute, Amanda Neville, is now looking into a partnership with the Beijing Film Art Archive and creating a BFI channel on China's version of YouTube. The, UK, the China Cultural Industry Investment Fund gives special support to sectors including entertainment, animation and digital games, TV, film production and distribution, publishing, cultural exhibition and internet media. Generally, however, despite or maybe because of it, doing business in China requires a strong network of support. <coughs> Partnership must be embedded within a larger strategic vision on a long-term basis, not undertaken on a purely project-by-project -project basis. Consumers and business may be now increasingly online in China, but as ever, building strong relationships is where the future still lies in China. In addition, it is clear that there is a real role for collaboration between the UK and China in developing creative industry hubs or clusters in China and the UK. And our cities have done much to turn themselves into creative hubs. We have Media City in Salford, Manchester, which now contains, uh, uh, in, near Manchester, which now contains the main studios of the BBC, and Manchester Airport City Enterprise Zone is becoming a northern digital hub with the aid of £800 million of Chinese investment. 
and we have film studio developments such as Pinewood Shepperton, as I mentioned, or such as Warner Brothers Leaveston, where the Harry Potter films were made and where there is a now super, superb tour, uh, incidentally. And we have film, photography uh, and production in Brighton, uh, video games and special effects in Dundee, so a whole range of different hubs and clusters. And there is no doubt that in China uh, they can benefit from this kind of experience in developing and managing space suitable for creative enterprise. Tech City in East London is emerging as a potential rival to Silicon Valley in the US, with Vodafone, Google and Facebook taking space. Now some major Chinese technology companies are becoming involved and committing to investing in the long-term future in the area. I've mentioned Manchester Airport, City Enterprise Zone earlier, uh, 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 and there are a number of other significant investments uh, taking place. Best practices out there for us to share with our partners. I'm sure that there are strong partnerships to be made between British companies and cities and Chinese municipalities and enterprises in developing and managing space uh, suitable for creativity of all kinds. Leading educational institutes have set up research centres and have been engaged in developing policies and plans for industry cluster mapping on behalf of the government. Certain cities in China are successfully turning themselves into creative hubs. Beijing is home to more than one million creative professionals, whilst other leading cities in the sector include Shanghai, Hangzhou and Shenzhen. And then, of course, there are plans for the new West Kowloon Cultural District in Hong Kong. Just look at Hangzhou, for example, the capital of Zhejiang province. The annual average growth rate for radio, TV and the film industry is currently over 20% and is committed to becoming a national digital TV industry base. There are 200 TV and film production companies in Hangzhou, and the Hangzhou municipal government determined to turn it into the animation capital uh, of China uh, as soon as they can. And of course, we've had a number of successful Chinese film festivals here in London, and we're all looking forward uh, to the Screen China Summit uh, this December. On the in inward investment side, what I hope will become an increasingly typical example is Reiku. Reiku is Asia's largest social gaming company and recently announced that it is setting up a base in London's tech city, the first high-profile Chinese technology company to do so. It currently has 15 million daily PC gamers and 10 million daily smartphone gamers, predominantly located in China. We, of course, all need to make sure that creators are able to monetize and receive proper reward for their works and the skills that they have and the partnerships and collaborations that they enter into. Intellectual property protection through copyright enforcement is a subject of increasing importance in the digital age. In previous times, we did not necessarily have a common agenda with China but with much more intellectual property now being created in China between us, we can work in partnership to protect it. And working in dialogue uh, between the Chinese government and the UK intellectual property experts, together we can make progress towards much better intellectual property protection and enforcement. In China, the IP protection regime is rapidly changing as Chinese homegrown IP grows in importance. We need to stay abreast of the new business models, but all to a greater or lesser extent depend on good IP protection. And we must ensure reform in China and elsewhere is timely to enable creative content to be exploited both on the regulatory and uh, legislative reform side and the development of education of the public and others in the value and importance of IP to the creative interests are vital uh, for their future viability and in their ability to deliver quality content. For some time now, we've had an IP, an expert IP attaché in Beijing giving regular updates on the many welcome copyright developments in China. And I'm delighted, too, with the MOU signed between our China-Britain Business Council and Alibaba designed to protect and enforce intellectual property rights on property sold through the Alibaba platforms. <coughs> and there's also common recognition that our UK centres of creative education are world-beating. What is needed for SMEs to take the plunge into China are effective cultural and business relationship bridges and one of the key ways of doing this 
is through Chinese alumni of UK universities. And that, of course, is where many of you come into this. Cultural and educational exchange is vital if we're to nurture creativity in both our countries. And I'm sure you'll agree with both those propositions. Student alumni are a growing and important source of soft power for the UK and a cultural bridge for British business. We need to ensure that our strong international links with China and Chinese students and postgraduates thrive. LSE is blessed, of course, at both postgraduate and undergraduate level, with a much higher than average percentage of Chinese students. And I understand uh, that they now stay in touch with at least 4,000 Chinese alumni. There's growing recognition that our centres of creative education can partner together. I see there is a strong LSE link, for example, with Tsinghua University, Beijing, and an annual LSE China conference is held there. Our UK higher and further education sector make a major contribution to the development of talent and skill for our UK creative economy. Some 16% of our students are engaged in courses relevant to the arts and the creative economy. And many of our universities and further education institutions make a unique contribution, and they represent hubs for innovation and centres for research. They engage with industry players, they facilitate connections with creative SMEs and build networks. And many of them have important partnerships with cultural institutions such as museums and galleries. And we in Britain do want and need to attract the best creative talent possible, both from China and elsewhere. And we have increasing numbers of Chinese students studying here in a whole variety of creative skills, art, design, film, animation, and so on. But we must make sure that the student experience for Chinese students in creative skills in the UK is excellent, and we create and tap into networks which they have when they leave. We need to create more paid internships for Chinese students in the creative industries and the arts. To its credit, the British Council has worked with Chinese partners to successfully organise the first Sino-UK higher education cooperation in the creative media industry this last year. The programme has facilitated the successful establishment of strategic partnerships for new media collaboration between a number of Chinese and UK universities. Visa policy to date, as regards Chinese students, appears to have taken no account of the balance of risks and rewards involved. 100,000 or so Chinese students in the UK bring huge benefits to our higher education institutions and their host towns and cities, and they comprise 26% of all international students. The sooner the government sees sense and excludes students from the overall immigration figures, the better it will be for the health of our higher education sector. There are some bright spots on the visa front, however. To attract elite global entrepreneurs working in the digital technology sector, we opened an exceptional talent visa route in April 2014. And this will provide an immigration route for individuals with a proven track record in developing successful businesses or creating new innovations in the technology sector. So, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I hope I've successfully illustrated that the creative industries in so many ways offer China and the UK massive opportunities for effectively working together to our great mutual benefit. I hope that whether we're in the public, public service, academia or business, we can all successfully rise to the challenge. Thank you. Um, again, I said right at the beginning that um, you were going to absolutely nail it, and you did. Um, I'm going to give you a glass of water. I realise you probably <laughs> are like a desert there. We can get that sorted. And it gives you a chance to direct. And I'm going to burble a little bit. Um, I've made quite a few mental notes. And the key word up there that I think we need to look at is partnership. Because I think the things that, that you were saying, one of the key roots of success is partnership. It's not just a simple matter of we buy, you sell, you sell, we buy. 
And I think it starts very, very early, and it starts very much with student level. Um, I'm a governor at the Arts University Bournemouth, and film and animation is one of the strong points, and already there are links with China in that, particularly in special effects. And that I know that as a governor, the one of the things that we look at are the importance of international links. And certainly, China is one of those key places that combines a market, but also a whole new way of looking at things and a whole new way of dealing with creativity. But I think the point that you made that can't be emphasized enough, that in the culture of creativity, striking partnerships, working with people, collaboration, is a key way of ensuring the creative process. It's not just one person alone in a room with a computer, having done a four-year course in whatever in Central St. Martins or in, in Tsinghua School of Design. It's when you get out, how you collaborate, it's so important. And as you do, I'm sure you've all been reading the October edition of Italian Vogue, well, some of us here have, and that's me. And they did a review of the latest 20 new important fashion talents globally. 12 of those talents are from China. And these are Chinese students, some of whom have been educated in China at um, the design schools such as Tsinghua, but also have been um, educated at Central St. Martin's, University of Westminster, um, London College of Fashion, Kingston, other, other parts of the countries as well. And what you're looking at is, again, the global referencing, the global phenomena of talent, education, students, products, design. And without falling into that sort of dreadful word, global, but the idea that we are dealing in a world which can shift and morph and buy and change and see influences from the East on Western designers, influences from the West on Chinese designers, and how, in fact, the whole East-West thing just breaks down into some amazing mashup, whereby you're actually looking at products that sell, that reflect, that influence. And I think what you've mentioned here so effectively with key details and key important points of actually saying this needs to be done is how the creativity how creativity and how the creative industries do make a difference to people's life and i think i'm just going to leave you with those two words i think when you talk about creativity you're talking about the creative industries and if it's an industry it will employ people in all countries make money and actually, it's more than just ideas. I think what's great about the creative industries is you have the best of both worlds. Concepts, ideas, putting forward, and an industry, something concrete that will provide a job. I don't know if you'd like to make a few comments on that or anything, and obviously we've got plenty of time to um, take questions from the floor, but I don't know if you've had time to water, if you'd like to sort of mention anything. Yes, uh, I, very much so, Nick. Thank you. Um, that's a very useful counterpoint. Um, I think the important point is uh, it's got to be a genuine partnership. This is not just a kind of relationship where one side gives and the other takes. Uh, it is about developing skills, uh, creativity, and so on. And uh, I think one of the noticeable things about things like um, British Fashion Week, uh, and I think we now have four of them. We have one, uh, have two for women and two for men in the course of the year. And I uh, am quite close to the British Fashion Council, and so I sometimes. Uh, uh, go to the shows or I reflect on the weeks that they have and it is absolutely noticeable over the last uh, uh, couple of years uh, to see the rise of the uh, Chinese designer in both men and women's wear basically um, and that is a very notable uh, uh, aspect of it um, and many of them as you say are actually being uh, uh, trained, if you like, or educated, whatever the, the, the appropriate word is, in our fashion schools and in our um, uh, creative colleges. So, I mean, that is a really important thing. And of course, they have exactly the same issues that our young designers do, which is 
Um, and I uh, talk regularly, um, probably more often, to young um, uh, musicians and would-be music managers. It's really how to monetize the uh, talents and the skills that they've got and that they've learnt at, their, at college, um, because that is one of the big difficulties. It's getting um, uh, uh, to the point where you can start up a business or you can uh, uh, exploit the kind of knowledge you've got and actually earn a living out of that. And that's one of the issues and one of the, the, the frequent areas um, where people forget that it isn't enough simply to have a talent or uh, 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 creative talent or uh, experience in something. You've got to be able to actually build on that. And, uh, uh, and, and it isn't always a question of going to work for somebody. In fact, nowadays, I think that uh, more and more people do not want to go and work for somebody. They might do an internship or they might get experience, but actually they want to strike out on their own and therefore they need to know and need to have those commercial skills uh, that will actually help them uh, run a creative business. And uh, uh, I'm afraid to say that creative businesses face unusual issues in terms of raising finance, in terms of uh, persuading people to back them. Crowdfunding is making something of a difference, but uh, because uh, creative industries are perceived as more risky, then uh, uh, inevitably they're more difficult uh, for people starting them up. And I don't believe that's any different whether it's in China or in the UK. Uh, 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 and of course, you know, the commonality is also the digital economy, which in one sense makes it easier to get started, uh, but in another sense, to achieve scale is sometimes uh, more difficult as well. So uh, uh, there are all sorts of schemes. And for instance, the British Fashion Council um, that, uh, that my firm gives a bit of pro bono advice to have a scheme called New Gen, where they select a certain number of promising designers um, and they help them develop their commercial skills and uh, you know, move towards um, a sustainable business, uh, which is what it's all about. And I think we need more of that in more different creative sectors. Um, and I think people are more and more aware, especially with banks, frankly, not delivering what they're meant to be delivering. You know, uh, uh, the last source of finance many, many people now go uh, to is, is for bank finance, because frankly, banks don't seem to perform the function which they're meant to perform. Um, and that's why at least uh, crowdfunding uh, has some benefits. I think um, that leads into a very good point for questions from the floor. Um, what I'd do, I would advise to, to collect uh, a couple of questions, um, so pairs or threes for. We um, need you to speak into the microphone, otherwise um, they'll be on the, because this is being recorded, um, it'll just be silence in the question bits, which will be a bit oracle-like. So, any, uh, anyone would like to kick off? We've got a gentleman in the middle, and at the back, so we can work our way to the front. Uh, thank you, Lachlan and Jones. Where does the UK's primary and secondary education policy, especially on the teaching of the Chinese language, stand in all these? And is there any prospects of the British public able to uh, speak Chinese in the same fluency or level of, ex level of fluency they can, like comparable to French and Spanish, let's say? I'm afraid um, you'll find that we're not discriminating against Mandarin. Uh, we're lousy at every language. Um, I mean, that's the truth of it. Uh, the, the, it's really a cultural problem. Uh, I think we share it with the French, funnily enough. It's the one thing we do share with the French, uh, which is this total lack of interest in trying to speak anybody else's language. Um, I mean, it's something that we know that we ought to change, but, you know, I did modern languages to get to university. Uh, and then I learnt another couple of languages by the wayside. Now that seemed to be the right thing to do, but that is a fairly unusual uh, approach. Uh, 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 and uh, you know, we no doubt Baroness Cousins um, in the All Party Group is battling with this particular issue. But for instance, you know, the, uh, our, our government at the outset, uh, I think, uh, made um, one of our uh, non-compulsory. Uh, at secondary school level to have a, another language, to have a second language. Well, if you're fighting against that kind of prejudice within the Department for Education, um, then you're fighting, you know, a pretty hard battle, basically. Uh, and what I think we'll just have to settle on is that everybody in China eventually speaks English.
I'll, I'll get, I'm just going to say a few words of this. With my name is director of the LSE Language Centre. Um, I should have said Nihao, which is like about the most limited in my Chinese, but, but I am fluent in German, French, uh, Dutch. My Italian isn't bad. So, you know, I've got four languages, um, a fifth one around the corner. Um, there is, you're absolutely right, and there's good news. Mandarin is one of the approved languages to be taught in primary school. Um, it's going to be a long, long wait, but languages are now compulsory in primary school, and Mandarin is one of the languages on offer. Um, hopefully, as the years go, that um, it will be properly compulsory for language up to 16 again. At the moment, if you want the e back, so the, um, the, the, the certificate saying you've got basically a good traditional education, you've got to have a language, which means you've got to do a language up to 16. We then have the big question of 16 to 18, where languages were never compulsory in the UK. So you have got that drop. But there is an awareness that things went very badly wrong. The good thing, it's a fine bit of good news about <coughs> languages, although the number of people doing a degree in a language, or even 50-50, has dropped over the last 10 years. It has bottomed up, and there are little, little raises. But the numbers that have grown, the number of people doing a degree with a language component, it might be 25% as it is at LSE, it might be 10%, 15%, or people indeed doing a language as an extra, has grown exponentially, and we've got the highest. There are around about 100,000 students doing language as either a small part of a degree or to up to 25%, or as an extra. Those numbers don't get formally recorded or explained, so it always seems to be bad, bad news. And this is a good bit of news. And the big growth language in that category is, of course, Mandarin. So um, there's a bit of a catch-up now, so uh, things are going to... So that's my... Advertising for languages no. over and done with. There's only one thing I would say relative to this, uh, 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 on top of what Nick had to say, uh, which maybe he can influence, um, uh, and as the father of a 17 year old, um, the gap year, I think, is a fantastic time to learn a language. I went to Spain, as it happened, in my gap year, but I deliberately engineered it, so I got a gap year. I don't know, it was probably I was ducking and diving and, and didn't tell the university I was going to that I was going there until later and so on. And it was possible to do that then. Now, gap years are really quite difficult um, uh, to, to get promised by the university that you apply to. And I think that universities uh, would benefit not only from more mature students if they, had, if they allowed gap years, but also students would then be able to go abroad uh, and do, and I think, you know, Mandarin is a kind of language where you need the year in order to do that. Um, and I would love my son to do that, uh, to go and do a gap year in Mandarin. Um, and in fact, I've almost made it compulsory. But the question is, um, is, he, is he going to be able to get given the gap year by the university of his choice? I wonder. Uh, and more information about languages on the British Academy website under the Blo Born Global Project, which the LSE is doing a special ah. research into as well. So, Born Global, British Academy. And languages are very creative. That's the segue back to the creative industries. So, we had two more questions, I think. We got it. Oh, right, you've got it. Great, fantastic. Um, thank you, Law, and also thank you, Nick. Uh, it is my privilege being here today, and hope you can remember me, Karen, because I took a flight uh, 13 hours to being here to catch up this conference <laughs> and then <laughs> yeah and also uh, because as I know there was a uh, new announcement this morning uh, that that uh, Prince William will be attempt to the great festival in China next year in October I think that was all about you talking tonight uh, the creative partnership it's not just a business deal it's a partnership so how do you think how significant about the Prince William will visit China to also attempt to the, the Great Festival. Because as I know that um, the Great Festival in China, it has been go through three years already. And not only selling the fine foods, household products, and also the fashion design goods. So um, what do you think what's more we can um, 
I mean, carry on about this partnership? That's my first question. Well, I, I think uh, uh, Prince William going is great. I, 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 when you mentioned fashion, I just hope that Kate manages to go. Um, but the, the problem is that, of course, she's expecting her second child, and that is going to be tricky. The ideal combination would be for the Chinese public to be agog at whatever Kate is wearing and instantly go online uh, on Taobao or whatever it is um, to, uh, uh, to buy what she's wearing. And then our British fashion designers would have, a, uh, would have an absolute field day. But I do think that having Prince William go in person is a great uh, uh, improvement on uh, purely having him in the Madame Tussauds waxworks. Uh, um, and I'm sure he'll do a better job than the waxwork. And also, uh, my second question is about, um, uh, yeah, I totally agree about uh, you two talking about the, uh, the education exchange, I mean, cultural ed education exchange part. But also, I do believe that so, um, not only about the creative um, produce in the UK, I mean, the, I mean all the, the, the professor being told us how to create the, 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 the perfect digital films or anything, or so the design, architect, art. But also I think um, um, we, we need to um, do is more about the operation part as well in China, like it's especially like after we graduated, when we go back to our own country, uh, we can't just show um, our employer then how good what we've been doing, but also about the operation part as well. And then because I've been living here for so long, I know um, not only about the creative produce, also the operation is the most charming part in the UK. I think what I take from what you say is, uh, is, is that, you know, in a sense, if you graduate in China, you still need to learn about business and, and how you can apply your creativity in, uh, in a useful way and so on. And, I, I, you know, you are the best ambassadors. I mean, it is a question of pressure and making sure that uh, when you do a post-grad course or whatever it may be in China, or uh, uh, you are an undergraduate in China, it's made clear that the courses need to change. And this is how a dialogue operates, basically. I mean, I, I, you know, you are the best ambassadors. You've seen what a creative education or, a, 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 if you like, a liberal arts education can do in the UK, which in many respects, I mean, I don't know a huge amount about the Chinese education system at undergraduate level, but I suspect it's much more structured, and I suspect it's much more about teaching rather than learning still, although I know that there are a lot of changes uh, that people know need to be made. But, uh, you know, you are the best ambassadors, and you're going to go back and, and work in, in China. You're going to be involved in those sorts of uh, uh, situations, and, uh, and I think that message needs to get through because uh, it's like everything else. Global competition... Uh, is a very, very important um, thing, in, not least in education. And uh, um, thank you, Lord Jones, and thank you, Lick. And I have one question about some things, like, because you, you mentioned, like, crowdfunding, and uh, you mentioned the film Coulter and everything. So... I wonder when you like cooperate with Chinese corporations or Chinese authorities, there must be some like limitations or restrictions. So I wonder how you balance both sides. It's like on one side, you, um, you, you need to like get over it, but on the other side, you cannot like sacrifice your own business philosophy or something like that because like, crowdfunding is not that uh, feasible right now in, in China and also like, like uh, a carpooling and, some, and something like that which leads um, some regulations, approvement and everything like that. So how, how, um, how do you like balance both sides and uh, make like a win-win or something like that? I, I think you have to be realistic about these things because both I've mentioned SAFT, but I could have mentioned GAP, which is the 
uh, the, the authority that determines whether you're allowed to publish something. You, you know, there is censorship in China, and one just, you can't do business in China without accepting the fact uh, that censorship takes place. So you have to be quite realistic and hard-headed about these things, and you have to uh, build stories and narratives that don't uh, infringe uh, uh, government sensibilities. There is no other way of doing it. And uh, you know, the, the, if you're going to do business in a place, uh, you have to respect uh, the sensitivities of that sort. Um, uh, now, clearly, uh, if you are a creative and you're a director, for instance, uh, making a movie, uh, you want to be sure when you're making it what the parameters are. Increasingly, as this co-production uh, deal uh, is uh, rolled out, and only two, as I say, have actually been rolled out, and the BBC one is a nature programme, so there isn't a great deal of censorship involved in a nature programme. These animals don't misbehave a great deal. Um, you know, there are uh, uh, issues which are going to arise, and we will gradually understand more about what those parameters are, but you're right, funders love certainty, and uh, I'm afraid there isn't a great deal, and we have to, well, we used the expression in that document about uh, crossing the river by feeling for the stones. Well, I think we're going to have to do that in the, in the words of the old Chinese proverb. You know, that's, that's part of uh, building a relationship, and that's what partnerships are. It is about learning from each other. But so I don't believe that suddenly, any time soon, we're going to find that uh, there's no censorship in, in, in China on creative matters. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for your great speech. And uh, I think uh, from a law school student right now, I want to ask a question from a legal perspective about... Uh, Ooh, I, don't like, know I don't know about law. Uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like uh, you have mentioned Taobao and uh, other Alibaba and other issues in China and uh, also the movie industry and the people watching a lot of... Uh, uh, copyrights that is not licensing in China, but uh, they, uh, they are actually watching it. So th these kind of intellectual property rights issues, how to enforce in China, is there any suggestions and uh, some advice for the government or the individuals in China? I want to hear about your perspective. Well, I mentioned the IP attaché in Beijing, and um, now we, we are, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Tom Duke has been there for about two years now, but we're beginning to um, uh, really get much more uh, uh, traction in China in terms of dialogue about intellectual property matters, which I think is very heartening. I mean, I, the judges n understand about enforcement of uh, IP to a greater extent, and there are um, schemes for training. I'm not sure, Richard, whether you're involved uh, in that sort of judge training, but um, there are, for the GB Great Britain China Council um, is, is a very important engine in some of these areas. And uh, that, you know, one, again, it's a matter of making sure that you have a dialogue to start with and then a genuine partnership. And uh, as I said earlier, the marvelous thing is we're going in the right direction because more IP is now being created in China. So, you know, um, uh, the more intellectual property that belongs to Chinese companies, the more uh, they will want to have good enforcement systems and protection systems in China. And that Alibaba MOU, I think, is a very, very important signal that if Alibaba uh, uh, is protecting uh, IP, then frankly anybody can protect IP, you know, um, uh, because it's quite difficult online in their kind of business. They, they have to interrogate, you know, they, they have to do due diligence on the products that they're selling, and they sell millions of products, you know, and uh, they have to assess whether it's counterfeit or genuine or, you know, all those sorts of things. Are they infringing people's copyright? They've undertaken quite a difficult job there, and I think it's much more straightforward when it comes to other areas. At the end of the day, it is the legal system, but it's also sensibility. It's educating the public as well. You know, we have a, a, a problem with piracy in the UK, as you know. Um, so I don't claim that we're wonderful, um, and we're not very good at enforcing low-level 
um, piracy and low-level copyright infringement. I think what we're quite good at is kind of enforcing industrial scale uh, design uh, infringement, you know, and, and a lot of the sort of major uh, issues. But, uh, you know, I don't think we're expecting China to run, you know, but they're, they're walking quite fast at the moment. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm Charles Small from Dezen Shera and Associates, an investment advisory firm based in India, China, and, uh, and ASEAN. Uh, we, we help a lot of foreign companies establish themselves in China, and also uh, they've, they've found the right partner, and I, I completely agree with your point that partnerships in creative industries really need to be right. Uh, once they've, they've found that partner, we, we help them get partnership off the ground through joint ventures. And f if you're not f careful, you'll get mobbed after this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah you w welcome to mob me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe not all at once. Uh, and, uh, uh, anyway, where was I? Uh, then then uh, once, once they've uh, got them off the ground, we'll, we'll provide everything they need to, to keep them running, all the, the tax, the HR, the compliance. And uh, I was very interested when, when you mentioned there are uh, British creative industries traveling uh, to China and, and really getting involved in these, these trips. Uh, what, what kind of scope for, for a company like Dozen Chair and Associates, uh, who, who also provides uh, the Asia briefing and China briefing, which I encourage everybody to read, uh, to, to get involved on, on trips um, of British businesses in, in China in the future? Good on you. I mean, I think that's, that's really, really interesting, Charles. I, I, I would uh, get bang in touch with UKTI, with uh, 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 Gina there, who, who runs the creative uh, industries side, um, uh, get involved in the, if you like, the country um, uh, specialists, uh, uh, China um, and other um, uh, Asian, South Asian countries and so on. Um, I mean, there are lots of people out there who can help. I and mean, indeed, even people... Um, uh, who do not ultimately consider themselves uh, commercial like the British Council because there's a crossover with the creative industries. The British Council have some fantastic people and they have a lot of knowledge in their head and even though they're not there specifically to help startups and so on, I, I think with their knowledge of the scene um, is, is, very, is very helpful. Um, and of course, you know, um, there are the trade section in the embassy here. You know, I think you, you need to make sure that you don't exclusively deal uh, just with the, uh, with the UK side. You need to build friends on both sides, if you like, because uh, you can suddenly get the light bulbs going off simultaneously um, uh, from both. And that's your, your big opportunity to create a marriage between um, two different businesses. But uh, what particularly I think is so exciting is that quite often there's a Chinese technical platform, if you like, a tech digital platform that is crying out for some sort of content which a European, UK uh, content provider uh, can insert onto that platform. You know, there's no point in reinventing wheels about all this. And I, and I think that, you know, that is, it, for me, that's one of the most powerful things because it, tr uh, we've seen the graveyard of Western digital operators trying to build a brand in China. We've seen retreat after retreat after retreat and the growth of the big Chinese brands because they're the ones that are trusted. Um, and therefore, I think one need, you need to know that you don't try and dash your head against the rocks with a particular business uh, 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 proposition. Um, that you, do you, you work with the grain of where we are strong uh, and, and we, we don't try and sort of, you know, uh, uh, do something which, which, which the Chinese already do extremely well themselves. Very good. Oh, we're good. Uh, three more questions. We'll have um, right at the front here, at the back, and if we've got time as well, we'll read a bit. Mind you, for it. By the way, I'm are, are you a bit cold? I think there's a window open at the back because certainly the, the Arctic blast is working to uh, the front, actually, so sorry if you're freezing a bit. Uh, I think the window's there, the next window's open, so it might be good to close it. Thank you. So I've got a question for both Lord Clement Jones and for Nick, and really triggered by this thing about light bulbs going off in kind of the two nations at once. Um, 
In terms of um, creative industries, do you think there's, um, there's something each system has uh, to offer the other in, in the way that Chinese culture is extremely good at collaborative working? And whereas creativity is seen through Western eyes, UK eyes, is more of an individualistic kind of endeavor. And those two things could, you know, could fit together quite well, particularly with the growth of digital agencies, where really the creation of something is very rarely done by a single person. Because as you said, you, you, ha you may have an idea that exists at a platform level, and then you need to populate it at the content level. So do, do, for both of you, really, do you see differences in the approach to creativity, and you know, can they fruitfully build one on the other? I think at the end of the day, that will come together. Um, I, I, I know exactly what you mean, but of course, you've probably have seen some of the um, uh, you've seen some of the sort of figures on crowdsourcing and so on and so forth. And that by itself is pushing people together because I think that a lot of crowdsourcers are pretty, you know, the, the, a one-person band is not really attractive. Uh, it's too high risk. Um, uh, that people know the best way of developing things, which is, you know, like they, I don't know, the smoothies uh, thing is a classic example of a group of people, three people or so, um, uh, bouncing off each other and, you know, in bad times through that sort of early startup period, reinforcing each other's determination and so on. So it's not only the ideas, it's the dynamism and the resilience of the business which is um, affected, I think, by whether or not you do it as an individual or as a group. Now, of course, either I'm sure that anybody in the room can quote all sorts of, of exceptions to that, but if I was a funder, if I was Devonshire, I'd say I'd actually like a group of people um, that were getting together, got the ideas, you know, uh, you've got complementary skills, you know, in one person getting the finance, knowledge, creativity, leadership, uh, marketing uh, knowledge, that's pretty unusual. So I would look to, for a team in any culture. I totally agree with that. I, I don't really want like an observation because I think that there is, you know, the, the, the idea of, you know, the individual from the West, the group, collective, East. And I think that although those exist, that you can flip those as well. And um, because there, there is a recognition of the creative individual in China. It's how you work it, how you exploit it. I think what, what I'm interested in is really a sort of, uh, the, 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 the appearance of quite, of an ironical stance and viewpoint, which I find fascinating in China, that they were, I'm not sponsored by Condé Nast, but there was a very interesting, it's looking at China Vogue. And when you look at, um, one of the things that I try and do, I try in September and October to get the main vogues from a range of countries, because you often get the same item of clothing, but the way it's described linguistically is quite interesting from the ironical viewpoint of British vogue to the sort of creating a sort of you know, philosophical poem in French vogue. The Italian one is just like adjectives with exclamation marks. Um, and it's the same item. And I was quite interested in looking at how China Vogue does it. And there was one particular interested one where they basically did a story whereby it wasn't straightforward, the collections done by designer. They took like decades. And so you had the 50s, that whole sort of couture thing, done both original stuff and modern stuff with some amazingly current Chinese actors, amazing acting as models. And it went through this sort of mashup of late punk and early new romantic. And what they had were actually Chinese fashion designers new doing this whole thing. And what you actually got was a really interesting thing of not just we're learning what happened and the decades we missed out on, but a recognition, yeah, they did miss out on that. And how are they looking at it and how they're using their own individual to, to saying, we are now 2014. We're the generation that was born 20 years before. And how we access this stuff, which belongs to the world, is through media, through magazines. And how we mix it up and how we do it is going to be quite original. And, and I was actually quite blown away with that because it stood out amongst all the vogues in something that was both analytical, creative, reactive, proactive. Um, and, and I thought from a point of view of 
something which is basically a very commercial magazine, um, Vogue. It's not, you know, leading in a way of creativity like something like, you know, Purple or Visionaire or any of the others would be. Um, um, I thought that was very interesting, and that's what I'm interested in, seeing how the young creative mind in China interacts, because it, it, it is so, so key for the future. We had a question over there, yeah. Thank you, Lord Climate Jones. Thank you, Nick. And uh, my name is Kai Liu I'm from University of Greenwich. And in the last few months, I, I curated an uh, exhibition to commemorate the very first group of Chinese students who ever studied in the UK in 1877. And uh, the exhibition was opened on 13th November by the Chinese ambassador Liu Xiaoming. And so I sent this invitation to our, every audience here. Uh, you can come down to the Greenwich and to the Ro old Royal Naval College. In the Painted Hall, uh, there's an exhibition about the very first group of Chinese students studying in the UK. So I couldn't agree more about your points of the importance of Chinese alumni. Uh, because in this first group of Chinese students, one of the students whose name is Yan Fu, uh, maybe some Chinese students know, know this person. Uh, when he returned to China, he became the most important Enlightenment thinker, educator, and translator. He translated Adam Smith's Wealth Nation from English to Chinese. He translated John Stuart Mill's On Liberty from English to Chinese. So basically, he translated eight classic social science books from English to Chinese. So uh, I think the that says uh, the, the importance of the Chinese students. You know, the first group of Chinese only six, and one of them already changed the course of Chinese history. Uh, but nowadays we have 70,000 Chinese students each year study in the UK, right? Uh, around 70,000, maybe, maybe not the exact number. But in recent years, I think the immigration, immigration policy hasn't been very uh, friendly <laughs> to the Chinese students Sorry. or to the, all the international students. And the recently, I think the, uh, uh, President Obama announced that and, uh, now American can give Chinese students or business visitors like long-term visa uh, for <clears throat> around 10 years. I'm just wondering from a like, political point of view, and is there any policy we will be introduced to encourage this kind of mobility because of the partnership come from the collaboration and the collaboration, collaboration you need to <clears throat> the people's mobility. So any, any comments on that? I think that you've raised a very useful and important point. I mean, uh, well, for a start, let me just comment on the on liberty thing. You're talking to the right person here because uh, uh, John Stuart Mill was a well-known liberal and I'm a liberal Democrat. So uh, uh, that's one of the great works because what he looks at is the difference between what you might call liberty and license. And this is one of the big uh, issues in terms of freedom of speech and so on and so forth. So it's a very, you know, it's a very important book in that respect, um, and really, uh, I suppose, in many ways ahead of its time. But it is something uh, that uh, you know is worth international study, and I think that's great. Um, on the visa issue, um, I mean, uh, this has been one of the fault lines really in the coalition um, uh, government. Uh, the Conservatives made a pledge to. Uh, reduce uh, uh, net inward migration or net migration to below 100,000. Well, um, strangely enough, they have totally failed. Uh, it's now something like 230,000 um, uh, after uh, four and a half years of coalition government. So um, uh, they haven't been very successful, and I'm glad in many ways that they haven't been successful, but along the way, um, what they've made it, uh, uh, they've made it much more difficult for students because they got rid of what was the um, post-study work route visa under tier four, um, and they've substituted under tier five a sponsored uh, internship, um, which requires you to earn something of the order, and I can never remember the figure, of the order of 21,000, um, in order to be considered um, for a tier five uh, postgraduate uh, um, visa. 
um, which is, makes it much more difficult. And you, it, it seems to me to take away a lot of the benefit of undergraduates coming here because you know, people are not gonna um, be here forever. They basically want to do exactly what I talked about earlier, which is transition between their undergraduate, their gr uh, what they graduate in, and, and um, uh, getting experience in employment of the sort of skills, with the sort of skills that they need to have in order to be uh, successful when they go back um, to their own country by and large. I mean, this is, you know, this stands, and then you're building relationships between um, business, you're uh, between countries. Um, there are so many good reasons for doing it um, that I, 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 I'm still astounded, really, at the disjunct between our business and uh, uh, cultural departments and the Home Office. The Home Office has a completely different view about this. Uh, uh, you know, they're intent on clamping down in all sorts of ways and they talk about abuse. Well, the amount of abuse, uh, I may say, amongst Chinese students is absolutely infinitesimal and has been tracked by Home Office surveys themselves. Now, the good news is that in tourism terms, there has been quite a lot of movement and in business visitor terms have been quite a lot of movement. I just hope that the power of, if you like, the Chinese uh, spend on students means, you know, that actually we will make more progress uh, and we will get a better uh, regime. At the end of the day, I think students, as I said earlier, should be taken out of the migration figures entirely. It is completely irrelevant. You know, students are here for a finite length of time. They're here for a purpose. Uh, it is not a question of coming and uh, um, settling and um, being economic migrants or whatever it might be. It's a totally different story. And the sooner our home office get that out of their heads, uh, the better. But it won't happen, I don't think, under this government because the rhetoric and certainly with the rise of UKIP, the whole rhetoric about immigration has risen. And you can see that probably it's the most uh, toxic of all the political uh, issues that we face. But, you know, there aren't many politicians, uh, many parties uh, that are relaxed about immigration. We are. The only thing that we're not relaxed in my party about is about people who come here from other parts of the EU and claim benefits uh, and don't actually get a job. That seems to me to be an absolutely fair position, but it has nothing to do uh, with students whatsoever. Uh, and, you know, uh, we've got 100,000 Chinese students here. Um, it'd be very nice to have more, quite frankly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Round of applause. <laughs> um, just to plug your exhibition, it's on at University of Greenwich in yes. till, till, until... The 31st of January. Great. I should have congratulated you on a very creative question to start with, <laughs> to, get a, to get an advert in in the first few <laughs> sentences. Absolutely. There. Okay, um, we, we've just got, we're rounding up. Um, our question to you, because you haven't had a chance to, we have got time, we will go full circle, but it might not. But um, there will be a chance to, to ask questions over a drink soon. So we have right at the front row. Hi, um, Tim. Fantastic. Thank you very much. It was a very fast speech. <laughs> um, Trish Walker, Peking University. This week, the Federation of Cultural Creative Industries, or the Cultural Creative Federation, was announced by uh, Lord Hall, uh, BBC currently. And I was with him this morning, and um, I was asking him if he thought that this was going to be the answer to all our, all our problems. And he said, far too early to tell, of course, but at least we now have a body um, which will represent the, the cultural creative industries uh, in Britain and will round up all the different angles and departments and sections and groups and organizations, etc., etc. Two questions. One, what is your impression? Do you think that that will actually work out? Um, and two, how do you think China has managed this issue of a sort of federation idea of bringing together everybody? Very interesting. Um, I think the Creative Industry Federation may have some impact. Um, but 
uh, it was very long on celebs and very short on policies. And I'm a great believer when you launch something, what you need to do is to actually say, this is our manifesto. And I didn't see uh, too much of that. And I did go on the website straight afterwards to see if there was anything extra. Um, but strangely enough, the government body, the body that is in partnership with government, is much more um, to the point, in my view. The Creative Industry Council, which was founded in 2011 um, by the government, which has government ministers on it, so that, uh, and it has all the industry on it, so that they can say to government ministers, look, this is not adequate. Our financing isn't adequate. The visa situation isn't ad adequate for business or whatever, it, for visiting performers or, you know, the various things that, that, that apply. Um, to the creative industries, and they've done some very, very good work. So actually, and I think that, funny enough, this is a, probably a message that I think the Chinese appreciate, um, government is an essential partner. You can't just simply treat government as them and us as the industry. You know, there are so many things like tax relief, things like that, that have occurred over the last four years, which have been created by government because government was in dialogue with the industry and they recognized especially in terms of the games industry for instance where you know it was a great debate about whether this was um, uh, uh, this was state aid as uh, under European law and things of that sort well because the government had the will to do it they got through all that but you know if they were just being lobbied and treated as the as the enemy um, I don't think that would necessarily be a great idea as far as China's concerned I um, I don't know, but culturally, I still think that the private sector is not regarded as being as important as the public sector. If you're an SOE, you instantly, you know, your chairman has the status of vice minister or whatever, you know, if not minister, you are plugged into government, you know, um, I, 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 it's only certain major companies, Alibaba, Huawei, who begin to have really much impact on the Chinese government. And I suspect there's a long way to go before um, young startups, you know, young creatives really feel that they've got the, uh, the, 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 the ear of government. And I think that's not true, though, of municipalities. I think some of the municipalities, because they want to build cultural hubs, Nanjing, Hangzhou, Jingdao, and so on, are much more user-friendly. So I suppose if I was a, a young Chinese startup, I would want to relate to my municipality, and I would try and forget about the central government for quite a long time until I became as big as Huawei, uh, and that might not happen for a few years. I think that's great. Well, look, this is perfect timing. And I think what we've discussed, and it really thanks to you, Lord Jonas, is the, the importance of a partnership, dialogue, exploration, getting things done, starting early. It starts at education, universities, connections, and it's a whole process. But what I've got from you, and I think we all have, is the energy you get where you gave your speech, I noticed you said it was a really quick one. I loved it because it really sort of rattles through with the energy of things are happening, things are beginning, and the input that anybody can make in the creative process, whether you're a consumer, whether you're a creative, whether you're a producer, we are all in this process. And I think that what you've got um, are so many ways of creating, so many levels and so many areas. And I think that the one thing we got when we go away from this is the potential of everything. And there will be a way of asking more questions because drinks are available on the fifth floor of the old building in where well, we sort of taken over, I hope we've told people, the director's dining room and the chairman's dining room. Um, and drinks will be available there. So um, you have to go across Houghton Street into the old building, up to the fifth floor, into the senior dining room area, and you'll see chairman's dining room and director's dining room there. We'd love to see you for a drink. So thank you very much for coming. It's the first real sort of wintry evening. And thank you very much, Lord Jones, for really a great talk. Thank you.